So Mark and Theo, you guys are a part of the uh, Dream Team sound team on Blade Runner 2049. Um, working on a sequel to a movie that is such a classic and was so innovative in so many different ways, including in its sound design, uh, was that intimidating for you or, or challenging? I mean, how did you, I guess, uh, get into it? I would say it was more inspirational than anything else because our one of our early tasks was to understand what made the first film so rich and interesting sonically and then find a way to deconstruct it and make it our own, which is to say we never wanted to imitate that film, but we honor, wanted to honor it in the way it was so effective in, and sort of subversive in its use of sound. Mm -hmm. Theo. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, there was certainly a, a certain amount of, um, you know, weight at the back of my mind of, you know, this is a movie that me and all of my friends were deeply in love with for years. You know, the original yeah. Blade Runner, probably I, I could even go as far as to say sort of inspired me to, to work in this field in the first place. So, yeah, there was this huge weight of responsibility, but um, that was lightened to some extent by the way that our director approached it. I mean, he was very clear that he was making a film that took place some 30 years on from the original and therefore things had evolved technologically and stylistically. Therefore, you know, he, he made sure that we knew never to, we were never expected to be slavishly reproducing something from the original movie or even you know, providing did. a completely direct yeah. continuation. It was just a return to that universe. That was what he sought from us, was the ability to seed enough things that made, that made us feel familiar with the Blade Runner universe. But when it came to specific technologies, the sounds of spinners and blasters and, and, and everything else, even the sort of advertising that you hear off screen, you know, he is very much encouraging us to, um, to enter into the spirit, um, but to be, you know, to have the creative free reign as well. And, and that really took the pressure off. I think as soon as he started hearing those ideas and going, yes, that has returned me to the Blade Runner universe, but it's an original thing. That was, that was, uh, Mm -hmm. well, it is a uniquely different movie from the original. Um, so I wonder, I mean, if you could point to maybe a couple of specific ways in which you made it your own. Um, I think the, what we did successfully in a, this analysis or deconstruction of the first Blade Runner was finding our way to immerse the, audi the audience in this kind of sonic landscape. You know, if you go back and listen to the first film, you discover that every scene is permeated by these sort of sonic, almost musical atmospheres or textures, and they are really um, valuable mood creators, working in a way that maybe almost score might do, but Denis had this very prescient idea to see if sound design could, could sort of carry that heavy load. So Theo and I spent many months creating um, a, a, a pastiche of these kind of sonic textures, these musical compositions that weren't necessarily melody or rhythm, but um, sort of enveloped the audience in the world that is the sound of Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. Actually, I mean, you bring up the, the music and I was gonna ask, because you both have a background in music. So, I mean, how does that, uh, I guess, inform your sound design and, and sound editing work? Well, well Theo, you go first. You, you're, you're very well known as a composer, so please take that. Well, at the same time, I think all of us, I, I was surprised, you know, not only certainly Mark and myself, but um, our, our mixing re-recordists, uh, Doug Hemphill and Ron Bartlett, they're also accomplished musicians. You know, it's surprising how many people working in, in sound at the top end have um, have a background in music. I think it's it's all about orchestration, and that doesn't necessarily mean using an orchestra. It, it's really about the arrangement of sound, um, and sound can be either tonal or atonal. Um, and I think you know having an understanding of what the the elements needed to create a satisfying sound is a lot of the same things that you need to know to create a satisfying chord. And beyond just satisfying if you want something to instill fear in people as an engine passes, you know, it's going to be a different type of chord to one which is meant to sound like, um, you know, it's the good guy's vehicle. I think there's a, a lot of musicality that goes into 
um, every aspect of sound design, probably even down to the Foley. I think, you know, everything, it helps certainly um, for myself and Mark kind of overseeing what goes into the sound to have that um, musical oversight. I think, you know, we are arranging and we're um, in, in very much the same way that an orchestrator or a composer puts together different sounds from different instruments and and times them and uh, um, and makes sure that the, the notes that they play go together well. I think that's exactly what we're doing. And strangely enough, you know, nowadays, the technologies and the programs that you use to create these sounds and work on them, manipulate them and sequence them are basically identical to the tools that the, they're the same programs often as the tools that the, the composers are working on. So yeah, I think it, it was one of the things that really um, gave us an, an unusual um, musicality in, in the sound, the fact that all of us are, are musicians in one way or another. I, I want to add, Theo, that, uh, you know, when I design, I don't, I'm not using a different skill set than when I compose or write a song right. or a piece. And in fact, I think on a, maybe a more meta level, you and I were building sound in the same way we would build an entire song or a composition. We're very sensitive to the dynamics of the sound across time, not necessarily in the sort of um, granular view of a specific sound effect, but we were always very sensitive of how does the envelope of sound play over time? Just like you, when you build a song, you want to start strong. You're going to have a B section. You go to a chorus, you go to a bridge. We're building sound with a very specific envelope, much in the way that maybe an orchestral composer builds, um, you know, a, a classical piece with three or four movements. We, we think in much longer arcs, I would say, because we can bring those uh, musical skills to bear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of sound in this movie. Um, <laughs> uh, talking to the uh, mixers, they described it as sort of a uh, orchestrated chaos, uh, I think is what <laughs> they called it. Uh, so, I mean, can you guys talk about how you, um, when you're taking all these different uh, kinds of sounds and you're trying to, how you create a, a good, clean track out of that? Boy, that's that's a whole another hour long conversation. <laughs> I'm afraid to say. Although I have um, to say, you know, I think a lot of what we were doing in that way was was very closely, more closely than I'm used to, guided by um, by the director and and our editor Joe Walker. I think both of them were very clear on whose head we need to be in at any given time. And if you know whose head you're in, you know, if if we're following inside. Ryan Gosling's head and, and we're and we're responding to everything that he sees and feels um, and everything that you know physically that passes him as he walks the street then we always have a very clear perspective and yes your character can be walking through cacophony um, but you know something about following those characters and their eyes very closely I think helped us a, a huge amount in knowing what sound to um, to come to the foreground at any given time and, and how to sequence how to sequence things to put us inside a character's head. Um, yeah, I think that was an important. I would, I would, I'll just make something up right now. I would call that <laughs> method sound design. I, I think, you know, if you, yeah. if you study um, uh, Stanislavski or who's the other Strasberg, mm -hmm. you know, what we're trying to do is find the backstory, get inside the heads of the characters. And once you understand that, once you understand their motivations and the meanings of a scene, the mechanics become a little bit simpler. You, you have almost a roadmap. It's an emotional roadmap to guide you. Um, so that, that's a very valuable technique for us. I, I think also, you know, the, the, just the style of this film in particular, we have these long evolving shots of, of an actor moving through a space and we go up close to his face and look at his eyes. And this isn't just for Ryan Gosling's character, but for Deckard and many of the others, there is a pace um, and a sort of psychological examination going on in Denise's direction and in and in um, and in the camera work uh, by Roger Deakins. I mean, it's there's something which really cued us in to do those kind of psychological method sound design as, as you. <laughs> I mean, what, what it felt like we were kind of putting ourselves in the shoe of of, of the character, and um, and then it all comes clear. Well, he is somebody who in his movies uses sound very expressionistically, you know, whether it's this or uh, Prisoners or Sicario or Arrival. So, I mean, what was that um, collaboration like um, between you and, and the director? Well, 
very succinctly, that's a, that's a very insightful question because the first direction we received from Denis was to quote, compose with sound. Those were his exact words to us. And I, you know, this sort of connects to my, an earlier statement I just made, which was that we, Theo and I wanted to design sound sort of across longer arcs of the film. We did not, Denis wanted us to work a lot less diegetically, which is a fancy academic term, meaning sound for what you see that's motivated by something you see on the screen. He wanted us to work much more impressionistically, more like a composer does, weaving sound across entire scenes or multiple scenes. And so in that regard, Theo and I worked a lot more like a, 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 an impressionist painter. We were like a Jackson Pollock painting. We were lobbing, you know, uh, paint bombs at the film canvas and allowing our sound design to splash across vast expanses of that canvas. And that gave us this, this very musical approach uh, that is much more sort of emotional and evocative, I think, than, than worrying about the, the sort of synchronicity of, well, do we have a sound for that thing we're looking at on camera? Yeah, it's as if sound editing is often tasked with very short, like you're given words. Um, and I felt like we were given whole sentences um, of, of, you know, that sequence where uh, Kay walks from the orange desert of Las Vegas into the casino. Um, and meets Deckard for the first time. I, I forget how many minutes long that is, but you know, six or seven minutes of pure uninterrupted sound design, taking a character from one location to another. Um, and that really allows us to, to create, yes, like a, not just a word or two here and there with the sound, but a whole sentence, a whole phrase. Um, and I think that was one of the great things also, you know, in Denise um, style and in Joe Walker's cutting that we were allowed to create <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, my phone rang. I turned it off. Um, Speaking of sound. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I'm sorry, Theo. I, did that, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I completed my phrase. <laughs> okay, uh, then one, one more footnote to that notion. I, I love that idea, that sort of allusion to writing in paragraphs versus words. In many ways, what we do as sound designers or sound editors is, is very kind of granular and word-like. We're, we're sort of detail-oriented. I liken that to uh, coloring book work. It's, it's the simplest form of what we do. You see something, you see something on screen and you color it in with your number three gunshot uh, crayon. Um, uh, Denis allowed us to color way outside the lines. You know, we, we created this very expressionistic painting of sound that, that was much more divorced from our, our traditional work of see a thing, hear a thing. In yeah. fact, at a screening that Theo and I went to, I was, I was really thrilled to have an audience member come up to me and say, I heard things I didn't see. And I found that to be the ultimate compliment. It's mm -hmm. something that some directors might be scared of. You know, they would see, um, they'd hear something that's not on screen and they're like, eh, that's kind of going to get distracted. What is that? Why am I not, you know, I'm hearing it and not seeing it. I think, you know, part of it is that Blade Runner is such a rich and sort of densely textured universe that you, you, you know, you expect to be able to hear the things that are flying above you and broadcasting an advert or whatever it is. But um, part of it is definitely Denis, uh, you know, in, insistence on an expressionistic and, and realistic use of, of sound. Yeah, yeah, he gave us, um, he gave us an unusual, unusual um, carte blanche to invent outside of the frame of the picture that we're seeing. Well, it certainly helps put you in that world and, and helps create that, that mood that you're going for. Um, right. so Kudos for that. Um, so you guys uh, received an Oscar nomination for this movie. Theo, it's your first nomination. Mark, you are a previous Oscar winner uh, for Mad Max Fury Road. Can you guys talk a little bit about what that recognition means for you? Theo, you're up. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I don't know. It's just, uh, it hasn't happened. <laughs> well, it's about, uh, I don't know. Um, it's, uh, it, it's an extraordinary thing. I mean, I think, uh, um, like many sound editors um, and composers, I'm used to working in uh, a tiny soundproof lightless room. And um, it's nice to be reminded that there is, <laughs> there's an appreciative, um, you know, to, to, to meet the members of the Academy um, and, and all of the people who sort of in their different roles. I, I was particularly uh, excited to meet Daniel Kaluuya at the, um, at the Oscar lunch, partly as I'm, he's in the film, which I'm working on at the moment. Oh. But he, he was so, um, 
so interested in sound and so interested in what what it is that defines whether a film has good sound or not. So we had a good chin wag about that. And it's just nice to know, it's nice to sort of, to have what you what you do in this sort of lightless um, cell of a room, sort of you realize that people are appreciating that it that it feeds into their art form. Um, yeah, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a novice to this Oscar nomination stuff. You, you should ask Mark. <laughs> well, one can never be an expert in this. It, it always comes as a surprise and a great thrill. I think this time around, what I'm most pleased about is that, you know, it's important that this is a, not, a recognition by our peers. So I get particular personal satisfaction that the best and the brightest in the world, the, branch, the members of the sound branch of the Academy, found value in our film. Why I find that particularly thrilling is that often these awards seem to recognize the loudest movies or the, the movies with the most sound. And I think this is a great acknowledgement by the best in the world that there's a place for really nuanced sound. I mean, Blade Runner has, we have our loud moments, no doubts, but we contrast them greatly with deep quiet and subtlety that I think is hard to find and often maybe hard to recognize. So uh, I, I'm really tickled by this nomination because um, it's, it's an acknowledgement that uh, great and nuanced and clever sound work is valuable. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much and uh, congratulations on the movie. It's really fantastic and congratulations on your nomination. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Really thank good you. to talk to you. Good to talk to you as well.